Good morning. We'll just take a few moments here and let everyone trickle in. So glad to see you all here. You're welcome to use the chat to say hello and where you're from. Make sure to address it to all panelists and all attendees so that it's not just coming to Corinne and I. Hello, Jacqueline. Thanks for saying hi to the panelists. And oh, we've got someone here from the UK. We're glad to have you here, Shane. And from the Burke, nearby to Korean and I in Seattle. Hi, Holly. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Afternoon, evening, or night, depending on what time zone you're in. So we'll go ahead and get started and maybe a few more people will trickle in while we're doing so. But once again, welcome. Good morning, afternoon, evening or night. My name is Beth Sanders. I'm the vice chair of the Registrar's Committee Western Region. And we're so glad you're able to join us today for this webinar in our series, Hands-On Practical Conservation for the Collections Professional. Today's webinar is sponsored by US Art. US Art is the largest fine art handler domestically and throughout the world. As a third generation family business, US Art's commitment to the safe transportation of artwork is unparalleled. With locations across the United States, including both in Portland and Los Angeles here in the Western region, be sure to contact US Art for your upcoming projects. And a big thank you to US Art for being a tier one sponsor of RCWR. If you're not a member of RCWR, perhaps I can convince you today to join us. In addition to this series of webinars that we've been hosting throughout the year, we're looking forward to actually hosting in-person events again next calendar year. But we also send out weekly job listing emails and an amazing quarterly newsletter filled with great content. And we have stipends available to apply for for regional and national conferences. Membership is only $15 per year, so please consider joining at rcwr.org. Before I introduce today's presenter, just a few Zoom logistics. Since people always are curious, I'll make sure to say we are recording today's webinar. So all of the webinars from this series are available on our RCWR YouTube page. So you can go there and check out anything that we've had over the last eight months. And this one will be up there as well within a few days. This is a webinar format. So while you can see Corinne and I, we can't see you. Hopefully you're comfortable having a coffee or a cocktail, depending on the time of day. We've got a lot of people saying hello in the chat function and I'm so glad to, do, to see that. Continue to use the chat function throughout. If you have comments about what you're hearing or an additional resource you think you can provide, just make sure to use that blue drop down and select whether you want to send your message only to the panelists, to Corinne and I, or to the panelists and all your fellow attendees. If you have a question about today's presentation, please don't put that in the chat, but instead use the Q&A feature. That will collate all of the questions so that we can address them and to Corinne together at the end of the presentation. If you have a question about what happening while the presentation is ongoing and something that needs immediate addressing, you can also put it in there and I'll be monitoring that as we go. Today's presenter is Corinne Landro and we're very grateful to you for being here. Corinne is an objects and sculpture conservator in private practice working in Seattle. She offers conservation services for the cleaning, repair, and treatment of a broad range of sculpture and objects 
from the monumental to the miniature. For museums, local and regional institutions and governmental agencies, and private and corporate clients. Other services Corinne provides includes condition and treatment documentation, collections assessments, environmental assessments, and general conservation consultation. Thank you so much, Corinne, for joining us today. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll turn it over to your presentation. Um, thank you so much, Beth, for the introduction and hello to everyone who's here. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you about, well, let's see. <laughs> I'm going to be sharing. Okay, there we go. We're going to be talking about mold and there we go. Okay, so managing mold in a museum environment. Guidelines for safeguarding your collections. So the facts. First, what is mold? Um, mold is an organism from the fungi kingdom, which is everywhere around us, indoors and outdoors, and all the time. It's a multicellular spore-producing filamentous organism. It differs from the plantar king kingdom in that it is heterotrophic, meaning that it cannot produce its own complex carbon molecules required for nutrition. As a result, it lives by assimilating organic compounds synthesized by other, other organisms. It's life cycle. Um, molds reproduce either asexually, which is the primary method, or sexually. Most indoor molds follow the asexual life cycle pattern. So um, first you have the hyphae growth. The hyphae are the cells that start the life process. There are cellular strands that release digestive enzymes, which help decompose the substrate for nutrition. As the hyphae consume the organic material, they will form a large colony called a mycelium. Once the mycelium is established and the right environmental conditions are met, the tip of the hyphae cells start producing spores or, con or conidia. The spores separate from the hyphae and dis di the disperse, disperse, traveling through air or water. And they will land on a substrate to start the germination process again and form a new hypha cell if the right conditions are met. And if not, they will remain dormant. Uh, the proper environment. Mold requires water, oxygen, and a carbon-containing nutrient source to grow. It thrives in areas of high relative humidity and generally can grow in RH of above 60%. There is no true consensus in, in the conservation literature on the subject regarding exact percentage for optimal RH for growth lowest RH for growth or recommended parameters, partially due to the fact that temperature and other factors such as the EMC or equilibrium moisture content in an object all have an impact on mold growth. Uh, for example, aspergillus, a common airborne mold, has two moisture content groups for dormant spores. One is low at six to 25% and one is high at 50 to 80%. The latter is dry loving or xerophilic and can germinate in an environment with RH below 60% and grow on dry substrates. So this gives you an idea of the fact that there are no, there are no tr very strict rules here. Mold is um, still uh, something we're, we're, we're learning about. And um, so uh, in terms of temperature, the range is broad. Uh, 40 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit will support mold growth if the other conditions are present and primarily um, high relative humidity. So um, as a general rule, we can say that to keep mold from growing, ideally uh, the IRH should be below 60% or even 55%. And um, a steady uh, temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit should be kept. 
Um, by the way, uh, the EMC mentioned earlier, um, that's the equilibrium reached an object between the wa water vapor in the air and the amount of water in the material itself. So for example, if the air temperature increases, uh, it dries out the material until diffusion equi equilibrium is attained with the vapor in the air. Thus a 55% RH with 70 degrees Fahrenheit environment will affect the EMC of the materials and their ability to support mold growth differently than a 55% relative humidity in a 60 degrees Fahrenheit room. Um, mold will grow on materials it can digest. The hyphae will secrete enzymes into, um, into the substrate to digest this food source. It will also absorb water, ad, adsorb water and oxygen from this substrate rather than from the air. Uh, the organic compounds preferred by mold uh, as a food source are cellulose, starches, and protein. Uh, here are some images from Wikipedia showing mycelia of different sizes and species. Sorry, the definition is not very good. <laughs> um, so cause for worry. Um, mold spores are everywhere and it is impossible to make them disappear. Uh, they are attracted to cellulose as found in wood and paper, starches as found in adhesives, sizing and cloth, protein as found in leather, parchment, gelatin and animal glues. Um, superficial soiling deposits such as dander, skin cells, oily substances, cloth fibers, or even pollutants on other substrates that are generally less attractive to molds will also promote mold growth. Additionally, some molds contain colored substances capable of staining the substrate. So in other words, molds are dangerous to a range of collection materials from paper to basketry photographs, leather, and wooden artifacts. So if you have a mold bloom in your museum, uh, what is the first thing that you can do? Well, you can do an in-house assessment to start with. So is it mold or could it be a fatty bloom or a salt efflorescence uh, or some pesticide residue such as arsenic or mercury, um, corrosion product, pest residue, frass, dirt, adhesive residue, use related residue, um, cobwebs, who knows? So describe what you see and its characteristics. Uh, is it crystalline? Is it fibrous? Is it fuzzy or grainy or hard or greasy, sticky? chalky, crusty? Can you see it being branched? Uh, is it crumbly? Uh, consider the substrate, its context and history, how it was used and how it has been maintained. Check the environmental parameters and whether they have shifted or some unexpected event such as a leak occurred. If the RH has reached and remained above 70% for a period of time, mold will grow. Uh, you can do some in-house testing. Using a magnifying glass and a light, examine the surface and try to determine whether you are looking at an abrasion or some type of accretion or efflorescence. Does it move or roll easily on the surface like insect frass? Um, with a small pointy tool, see if you can easily remove a small quantity of the material and see if it moves easily. See if it is powdery, crumbly, smeary, or greasy. If you were able to take a sample, uh, put it on a flat glass surface and see if it can be smeared. 
Um, if so, uh, see if you can put a couple drops of mineral spirits and see if, it, if that will dissolve it. And if that's the case, you're most likely uh, dealing with wax or some kind of oily substance, uh, such as a fatty bloom. Uh, usually they're found on leather or wooden artifacts and fatty blooms are very often mistaken for molds. Take another sample and place it on the glass. If you put a couple of drops of water on it, see if that dissolves the sample, because if it does, you may be dealing with a salt. If, avail if available, use a microscope to see more details. If you see branching structures or fruiting bodies, it is likely mold. So um, I have a few images of fatty blooms just because um, they can so easily be mistaken for, uh, for molds. Uh, here you can see some uh, on these um, leather bound books on their spine. Here's another example on a leather artifact. You can see how it is, uh, the bloom spreads very much like a mold, um, kind of a random patterns. And here's uh, an image of a wooden object showing a white haze. Um, wooden objects will often, um, well, will sometimes have fatty blooms um, and we'll see in a minute why. So fatty blooms, um, as mentioned, are found on wooden artifacts, skin or leather, and can easily be mistaken for mold at first sight. Uh, as, as you can see in the above images, uh, they resemble mold in the location patterns that they create on the surface in the in the colony appearance and in the occasionally feathery or fibrous look. They are, however, the result of fats migrating through the substrate and crystallizing on the surface. These fats were usually applied to the artifact either during the manufacturing process or applied later, um, either during use or um, later still um, while in the collection and uh, with the intention of protecting the object. Uh, Marie-Lou Florian, author of Fungal Facts, uh, published in 2002, identifies the main fungi orders found in heritage collections as the following. Uh, the Sordariales, which include Neurospora, Sordaria, and Chaitonium, it can be found in textiles, paper, and other cellulosic materials. And then the order of Eurotialis, which includes Aspergillus, Penicillium, and Eurotium. According to Mary Lou, they are the most common surface fungi found on artifacts and archival materials. So here are, here are a couple images of Penicillium. Here you see the mycelium and here the hyphae and um, the uh, fruiting bodies. Another image of penicillium. Um, as you can see, uh, the mycelium changes color as it grows. And here's an image of aspergillus or is it Aspergillus? I'm not sure. I think it is Aspergillus. <laughs> um, and in this case, it's um, Negro Aspergillus, which is black mold. And here's a close up of the hyphae. And this is, um, this is a picture I took this morning in my kitchen. <laughs> I had some um, leftover bread, uh, which produced these beautiful molds. Uh, I suspect that this here is uh, penicillium and um, the filamentous, the fuzzy filamentous uh, mold here, I believe is uh, rhizopus. And eventually it gets um, 
black fruiting bodies and then transforms into this type of mold. Yeah. Here's a close up of that where you can see the fruiting bodies here. And here's another close up of that same type of um, mold with the spores. So um, you have mold in your museum. How do you want to proceed? Um, for small to moderate outbreaks, less than 10 square feet and between 10 and 100 square feet, you can, this can generally be handled in-house. For larger areas or if a leak linked to sewage, to sewage occurs, or if it is suspected the HVAC is contaminated, contaminated by mold, uh, the outbreak should be handled by professional mold remediators. So the first step is to find out what caused the bloom. Was it faulty HVAC systems? Was it flooding or leaks? Um, is, it, or is it due to seasonal changes, temperature dropping and RH increasing? Um, in case of water damage to buildings or collections, the reaction time needs to occur within 24 to 48 hours to prevent mold growth. As the RH increases, hygroscopic materials absorb more water to reach equilibrium with the atmosphere. Poor air circulation, limited light, soiling all contribute to the growth of mold. However, only high RH and moisture content in the object can initiate and sustain the growth. So uh, personal safety is uh, one of the very important uh, aspects of the first response to a mold invasion in, in your museum. Um, although some molds are toxic, while others are not, all mold outbreaks should be treated as potential health hazards. Molds can contaminate the body by entering through small cuts in the skin, through air passages or by ingestion. People with compromised health should avoid the affected areas or materials. Contamination by toxic molds can affect the respiratory system, the skin, the eyes, cause serious infections, and mold odors have been responsible for na nausea, headaches, nasal irritation, fatigue, and dizziness. Um, those are, of course, all worst case scenarios. Uh, often, um, mold uh, will, I mean, mild mold infestations um, or outbreaks will not cause those symptoms, but uh, you want to be prepared and protected in the event that, that it could. So the recommended equipment for small outbreaks um, includes um, N95 disposable respirators. Uh, you can find those um, in hardware stores very easily. Um, disposable nitrile, nitrile gloves, which cover any exposed skin on the arms, preferably. Um, if the, the gloves are short, um, make sure your, your arms are protected with sleeves. Um, full seal goggles, uh, make sure they don't have vents on the side. Uh, for medium outbreaks, um, a half or full face, full face respirator with HEPA filters attached is recommended. Coveralls or lab coats, um, and if um, you're dealing with a flood with dirty waters, foot and head covers are also recommended. Um, after you, um, after um, using the equipment, uh, remove in a designated area, which will later be disinfected, uh, wash the clothes, uh, disinfect, and or dispose of equipment. Um, the disposable equipment, that is. Um, so first response is to locate the high humidity source. 
Are there any leaks in the building? Uh, check the HVAC, HVAC system. Maybe have an engineer inspect the ductworks. Um, another very important thing is to lower the humidity and increase the air circulation. So fix or adjust the HVAC if it can dehumidify the air. If it is thermostatically controlled or is a system which cools outside air and circulates it, turn it off as it can increase the, uh, the relative humidity. If you suspect mold in the system, then you should turn it off as well. Uh, install dehumidifiers and regularly empty the drainage water. Open windows if outside air has a lower RH. Keep lights on when safely possible. Use many fans, turn on at slow speed, taking care not to point them toward the affected areas. Um, in the event of a flood, the EPA recommends not using fans unless the water is clean. Um, and then the third, um, the third important element here is to isolate the contaminated materials. Um, it is best to dry them out in situ rather than move them around and risk uh, spreading the mold spores. In preparation for deactivation procedures, place a light and breathable cover on the materials, um, such as Tyvek, for instance. Uh, separate the non-affected materials by placing them in sealed six mil polypropylene bags. Uh, discard uh, disposable materials in the same uh, manner. And if you have a large outbreak, quarantine the area and affected materials and contact professional mold remediators. Uh, inactivation procedures. Molds need to be inactivated uh, into a dormant state before remediation can happen. So you cannot, you cannot kill mold, but you can put it in a dormant state um, and it will remain dormant until the right conditions occur again. So um, one way to inactivate mold is to put um, is to, uh, to do a small scale air drying of the damp materials. Drying will inactivate the mold. In an isolated area, place materials on the table, stand and open books and run fans facing away from the affected materials. Um, freeze materials at temperatures below 20 degrees Celsius. And actually it's not minus four here, whoops. Uh, it's not minor, excuse me, but I need to correct this. It's not minus four Fahrenheit. It's, it's more like minus 70 Fahrenheit. Um, freezing is not appropriate for all materials. Uh, you need to consult with a conservator first. Uh, some, uh, and I would also uh, recommend not placing wet wood in um, freezers because the um, the water will, the, will freeze and expand and crack the wood. Uh, anyway, uh, place your material in a sealed six mil polyethylene bag. Um, this will kill the active mold, though the spores will only become dormant. So yeah, you can kill active mold, but uh, spores cannot be killed. Um, a third way to inactivate the mold is to expose to UV light. Now the UV light can be damaging to library and museum materials as it accelerates aging. So use with caution and monitor. You can use sunlight on windowsills or outdoors um, if it's a non-windy day. Uh, you can also use an ultraviolet germicidal irradiation cleaner in the contaminated space um, and those, those cleaners can also um, be installed in the HVAC system. Um, and then uh, there's desiccant drying. So professional companies can run the moist 
affected air through a desiccant drying system and then reintroduce the drier air into the space. Once the mold has been deactivated, the mold can be cleaned off the affected surfaces. Uh, you want to test first to ensure the spores are dormant using a toothbrush. So gently brush the area. And if um, the, the, the mold is powdery, it is dormant. And if it is soft and smeary, it is still active. Uh, contact a conservator first to get a clear guidance on the proper steps uh, to remove mold on your collection. Um, but here has, are some uh, general guidelines. Um, uh, the first one is to use a HEPA vacuum. Using a small brush attachment, just gently vacuum with a HEPA filtered vacuum cleaner with variable speed. Uh, the variable speed um, element is important because depending on your materials, um, um, you want to be able to adjust the speed. Like for paper, you're going to want a very low suction. Um, so, and for fragile materials as well. Uh, you, also for fragile materials and paper, you can use a small brush to push the mold into the vacuum suction. Do not rub. Uh, exhaust should go into a fume hood or outside. And uh, you should make sure to disinfect the brush and hoses after use uh, with alcohol or detergent. And then after the HEPA vacuuming, you can do um, you can test the material for further cleaning um, by dry cleaning with a vulcanized sponge or graded vinyl eraser or modostock molecular trap for solid materials only, um, being gentle and only going in one direction. So if you find that um, these uh, different um, methods work, um, um, different cleaners work, you know, um, go ahead and use it because um, the vacuuming is a good step, but it is not enough to, to completely remove the, the mold spores. Also be sure to vacuum the, the graded eraser or sponge crumbs afterwards. Uh, a few tips, um, hold the books closed when cleaning. Um, sh uh, books should be held firmly uh, during cleaning. Vacuum paper through fiberglass screen uh, held down with weight. Always, always wear a respirator, goggles, and disposable gloves. Regularly clean the table and work surfaces uh, with 40% isopropyl alcohol. Mold damages the emulsion on photographs and negatives. Uh, so be sure to seek, seek the advice of a conservator before cleaning those. Follow up. So after, after you've um, removed the mold, uh, deactivated the mold and removed the mold from the artifacts, uh, you should thoroughly clean the affected area using one of the following solutions. Uh, 0 0.5 percent household bleach uh, in uh, by volume in water, 40 percent isopropyl alcohol by volume in water, 70 percent ethyl alcohol by volume in water. Uh, those are all good for disinfection, for disinfecting. Um, monitor all affected materials on a regular schedule. Uh, make sure the the mold is not coming back. Monitor the environment in the affected area regularly and uh, keep the RH uh, below 55% and the temperature at, at a steady 68 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Re relocate the materials which had been stored in unstable areas such as damp basements or areas that are near an out outside wall. Um, also be sure to keep um, any collection at least six inches above uh, a concrete floor. Um, 
and then plan preventive measures for the future. Assess new acquisitions and monitor for possible mold or pest infestation. Um, perform regular HVAC maintenance, inspection and cleaning, and regular changes of air filters because those are a prime source for mold growth. Um, perform regular building maintenance. Uh, keep storage uh, areas away from poorly insulated uh, areas in the building. Regularly monitor the RH and temperature. Again, um, below 55%. Well, actually, uh, I should say below 60%, uh, between below well, below the range of 55 to 60%. Um, I know it's, um, it's a little bit vague, but uh, the, there's literature that, that will show that mold can grow um, at 55%. So preferably below 55% if you can. Um, and then the temperature, again, at a steady 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Maintain uh, good air circulation. That's also very important. Um, protect collections by regular dusting and housing in boxes or polyethylene bags or putting protective covers over shelf units, shelf units. And keep the collection areas as clean as possible. Um, so, um, this uh, PowerPoint presentation is basically a summary of the following articles and papers. Uh, you might be interested in um, accessing them, accessing them yourself. They're all very interesting. And uh, here's a beautiful picture of mold. <laughs> and this is the end of my presentation. So back to you, uh, Beth. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, it's so, it, it's such a double-edged sword how beautiful mold is. You're like, oh, that's gorgeous. <laughs> and then at the same time, I do not want that anywhere near my collection. So yeah. um, if people have further questions for Corrine, um, oh, we do have a question. Uh, if we can just swipe back to the slide with the references. With the, oh yeah, sure. With one slide before. Yes, uh, yes. And just as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded, so we will have this online. But if yeah. you want to take a quick cell phone picture to be able to access those, those referenced articles. Um, so if you have any other questions, please put them in the Q&A feature. Uh, here we have one. If we find uh, mold on materials in a box with other materials, what should you do with the materials that do not have active mold growth clearly visible on them? Mm. <laughs> um, okay, the first thing I would do is separate the, the two, the affected um, materials from the, unaffect, the apparently unaffected materials. Um, I would uh, place the unaffected materials in a polyethylene bag, sealed polyethylene bag with um, a desiccant in it and, and monitor, monitor those materials for a period of a couple of weeks just to make sure they're okay. And then I would treat um, the affected materials as described. We have a question about staining. So mold often mold can often leave stains. Is there a way to reduce those stains? Um, probably. <laughs> uh, it will depend on the material. Um, if I mean I'm, yeah. I mean I, I'm sure, I'm sure it, it, it will be like very material specific. Uh, I'm an objects conservator, so. If say you had a stain on leather or you had a stain on wood or something like that, I would be able to tell you what to do for that. But then if it's on paper, I wouldn't know what to, what to do with that. Uh, you'd need to talk to a paper conservator. 
basically, I, I would recommend that um, if there's any staining on the material that uh, you contact the conservator uh, whose specialty that material is. We do have a comment that might be from someone with uh, a lot of paper experience that the purple stain on paper is often permanent. Um, mm -hmm. We have another objects conservator who is worried about tide lines. She has a map with a lot of mold that is in the freezer now, and she'll try some of the solutions you recommend. But is there a way to prevent tide lines? Uh, the tide line is from um, exposure to a flood or a leak or something like that, I suppose. Um, I mean, it's so again, it's on paper, right? A map on paper? Yeah, um, not a paper conservator. So I cannot, and I, I know there are ways to address it, but I, I am not sure. I, I, I cannot uh, counsel you on that because um, that's not uh, my specialty. Maybe the paper conservator uh, who's um, um, present could uh, may have a comment on that. Yes, we do have a, a paper conservator who wrote just to the panelists about that purple stain often being permanent. So thank you, mm -hmm. Amelina, for, for that comment. Uh, and it highlights the importance of speaking with a conservator who is a specialist in the with the object that you're looking at. So mm -hmm. we can only know so much. So always finding the right expert. <laughs> we have a question from Emma asking, should materials with staining always be cleaned? Are they likely to have reactivation if to, if, is the mold likely to reactivate if it's left on the object? Um, that's a good question. Um... I mean, I, as an object conservator, if, if an object is brought to me that has um, mold staining on it, I would certainly try to remove the stain. Um, and if the stain cannot be removed, um, I would want to make sure that uh, whatever mold is on there is, or whatever mold spores might still be on there um, and this is assuming that the object has already been treated and, uh, you know, the, the, this, the steps I've described in, in my presentation have been taken, I would have to assume that the, the, the spores are dormant and that unless the object is placed again in a situation where the conditions are ripe for mold growth, then, then it will happen again. But, um, I mean, like I said, you can never completely, completely get rid of mold. I mean, so, so the essential thing is after you've removed as much as you can, uh, you want to keep the object in an environment that will not promote that, that growth. The importance of going back to that, the RH values. Yeah. yeah. Um, if cleaning an object with ice purple alcohol, does it lessen the chance of mold coming back? Uh, yes. Um, um, I've, I've done that at times. Uh, however, um, I would also work with a conservator on that because um, using, um, and generally it's not, you don't want to use like pure isopropyl alcohol. You want to use a, um, um, solution of uh, isopropyl alcohol and water. Um, but, but sometimes it can leave stains. So you want to be very, very careful before using any liquid um, treatment like that. And again, it will depend, it will depend on the material that you're using it on. You know? So again, I would say before taking that step, consult with a conservator and get their recommendations or have them do it. So uh, I have a particular uh, question from my institution, uh, which is if we needed to dispose of something that also needed to be destroyed, so uh, a classified or restricted item that had mm -hmm. mold growth, what would be the best way to do that? Normally we shred items if we have to 
have to do that. But would that cause a damage to our shredder? Uh, yeah, that you wouldn't want to shred it. I, I would maybe you should just let it mold completely and 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 basically disintegrate <laughs> put it in a you know in some kind of sealed container um and and see what happens i mean if you'd want to make sure there's enough humidity inside that that sealed container for the mold to continue growing um but i wouldn't put it in the shredder Always fun. Uh, I don't know. I mean, unless unless you wanted to, I don't know, because cleaning a shredder with uh, alcohol would be could be kind of challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a unique property or characteristic of mold growth that could tell us right away um, if it was distinct from other contaminations such as contaminants such as the fatty blooms. So you had mentioned that the mycelium changes color as it grows. Does this happen mm -hmm. for all species? Uh, of mold, I think so, yeah. As it grows, it changes. Mm -hmm. Whereas the fatty bloom pretty much rema remains um, this sort of whitish gray kind of color. If you're planning to remove or deaccession an item from your collection, should you still fully deactivate the mold before you dispose of it? I, I mean, uh, yeah, because if you don't, you're going to be, it's going to be spreading wherever it's going. Is it ever appropriate to use a commercial mold killer or biocide or fungicide? Have any of them been tested by conservators? Um, the, at this point, they're not really recommended. Um, so, uh, and again, before using any any product like that, you'd, you'd want to consult with a conservator. Yeah. Um, right now they're not, you know, they're not recommended basically. What because they, 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 tend, they tend to leave, I'm, I, I'm sorry, but um, they tend to uh, leave residue uh, that will eventually affect the collection. So. What would you recommend to put in exhibit cases to prevent mold growth? Um, desiccant. Um, um, and... Um, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, you want to put um, stimulus crystals, <laughs> um, you know, the little purple things, the blue purple. I'm, I'm kind of not remembering the, the term for them, but basically, you want to put desiccants in there. And um, charcoal is good too because it, if if there's any kind of uh, uh, volatile compounds. Um, you know, the charcoal will also absorb that, so. You mentioned that air filters are one of the prime sources of mold growth. Is there a recommendation by conservators on how often those should be changed? Um, I don't have a recommendation on that, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know, it's a good question. I mean, maybe you check them like every three months um, just to see, you know, maybe visually, see if visually you, you can detect any kind of, um, I mean, if, if, if after three months they, they appear completely clean, then they should probably, they're probably fine. But I'm, I'm sure it, it's gonna vary um, in various, in, in different museums and, um, their location and, and all that will have an effect on that, so. Yeah, I, I can imagine it's building specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, and here we have a question, is silica gel an appropriate desiccant for- Oh yeah, that's, desiccant? okay, that, that's, that <laughs> yes, thank you, silica gel. <laughs> 
So yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I had another question myself. When you talked about the dry cleaning, you mentioned testing using the um, graded okay. eraser method. Yeah. What do you expect to find on the eraser? Um, when I say testing, it's primarily uh, to make sure that it, that um, whatever you're using is not negatively affecting the substrate. So you might not see uh, any mold spores on the uh, on the graded eraser or the vulcanized sponge. You may or you may not, but but mostly when I say testing is because you know you you just you just want to be gentle and make sure that whatever uh, material you are using this cleaner on is not going to be damaged by, by it. But generally, those are pretty gentle cleaners anyway. So, yeah. Well, I think we've gotten through all the questions. We'll, oh, we have someone who just put a question into the chat. Um, do you know if drugs against mold such as catamine AB and prevental are used in museum practice and how often can they be used? I wonder if that's along the same lines as the fungicide and moldicides. Drugs against drugs? I don't understand. Yeah, is that if, uh, Miroslava, if you could let us know if you mean chemicals such as the the fungicides that we discussed earlier. Um, we can follow up with that. But mm -hmm. if there's no further questions, uh, it's a great reminder that all of the health and safety aspects of handling objects that are contaminated or potentially contaminated, and also of how different materials will react. So it's always great to refresh and review the um, and learn more about mold and how it grows and how we can safely uh, protect our collections and ourselves when we find it. Yeah, there's no yeah. other. Very important. Very important to keep those masks on and gloves on and goggles on when you're dealing with mold. Luckily, we're used to the masks on and gloves on at uh, this That's point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, should be easy peasy now. So I'm just back on my screen. I wanted to thank you, Corrine, and thank you all for joining us today and having thank so you. many wonderful questions yeah. as well. I hope that you've learned something new about mold and mold safety in our collections. Uh, before we go, I wanted to announce our next webinar, which will be on Thursday, August 19th at 10 a.m. with Arizona-based conservator Rachel Waters talking about preventing corrosion uh, using barriers on composite metal and leather objects. So that should be another interesting webinar. Yeah, yeah. So to be fair, they've all been really interesting in my perspective. So I hope that you have found that as well. I'm going to put mine and Corrine's contact information back up here on the screen. So yeah. if you have further questions about mold and objects conservation, uh, Corrine's information is down there on the bottom. If you have more questions about uh, Reg the Registrar's Committee Western Region, this webinar series, um, or comments about a topic that you think we've missed, or a conservator that you think we should be highlighting in the Western Region, please reach out to me, rcwrvicechair at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. But, uh, thank you again, all of you, for joining us. Yeah. And with that, I'm going mm -hmm. to end the webinar, and we look forward to seeing you in August.